Hello and welcome to the Awareness to Action Enneagram podcast, a podcast that focuses on our distinct approach to this amazing system of understanding human nature. My name is Mario Sakura, coming to you from Philadelphia, and I'm joined by Maria Jose Monita. Hello from Santiago, Chile. And Tamar Zanati. Hello from Cairo, Egypt. We are partners at Awareness to Action International, a consulting firm specializing in practical applications of the Enneagram. You can find out more about our work at awarenesstoaction.com. In this season of the podcast, we are focusing on exploring each of the three instinctual biases and nine strategies through the lens of a movie, looking at one movie that we feel represents the essence of the bias or in your type. So make some popcorn, sit back, and enjoy the program. So we've been looking forward to doing this podcast for quite a long time and talking about it. We're going to take the first season is going to be looking at the Enneagram through movies. We're calling the season the Enneagram in a movie. And what we mean by that is we're not so much looking at movie characters to describe the Enneagram. We've gone through and we've picked one movie that we feel really captures the spirit of First, the three instinctual biases, and then the nine Enneagram types. So as we go through these sessions, we'll be talking about the movies and talking about characters that may not necessarily be the Enneagram type that we are talking about. In fact, it's a little bit tricky sometimes to talk about uh, movie character Enneagram types. And when we look at things online, either in videos or in podcasts, we think that there's really a lot of pretty poor work done around identifying characters by Enneagram types. So, so we want to keep our hands uh, lightly or our opinions lightly on assessing character types. But again, look at the whole theme of the movie and how that demonstrates a type. So we're going to start off with the transmitting domain. Tamar, what, would, what, would, what do you want to say here? Yeah, actually, uh, I, I like the process of preparing for this uh, season very much because I got to watch some movies that are really related to my youth and, and, and actually it made me remind some parts of my youth and other movies that are very good movies and uh, I rewatched them again and others that I'm watching for the first time. So actually, it's, uh, the whole process is fun. It has been a lot of fun. Yeah. Rio, say? No, I was going to say that in my case, it's for the first time that I'm watching most of the movies because I'm younger than the two of you. <laughs> 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 it's been educational. Uh, no, I've enjoyed it. And the fun thing here is that you don't need to know much about the movie to get value out of these conversations that we're going to have. We're going to be talking about human nature in general. They just happen to be portrayed in different movies that we're going to be discussing. Yeah. So I think this is a good point where we might want to let people know that the movie we're going to be talking about in this first podcast is the movie Saturday Night Fever, starring John Travolta. Uh, Maria Jose, how old were you in 1977? Three. Three. Okay. So... (laughs) So, so Tamara and I were a bit older than three when this yeah. movie came out. I was I was in high school, and actually that was the right movie for high school. Actually, <laughs> I, I was I was getting to to I mean to uh, train myself on the steps of the different dances. So it was really big at that time. Yes, yes. Now, uh, Tamara, you're younger than I am, and you said high school. Um, yeah, but probably maybe preparatory uh, okay. age or something. But remember something, that in Egypt, we watched the movie at that time, like two, three years later. Right, and right. only when I rewatched it again, I found that, that we, wo- we watched the PG mo- uh, version, um. not, the, uh, not the 18 plus. So for me, when I'm watching it now, it's a completely, a little bit different movie and it's enjoyable as well. <laughs> yes, and, 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 and this brings us to a point here. We, I mean, we have to say that this movie was made in 1977 and it was a different time. Um, certainly this movie would not be made in quite the same way 
today, right? There are there's certainly some language that would not be acceptable in a movie, some racially tinged language and some misogynistic language that uh, is, is not really acceptable. Uh, also, there's a couple of scenes that, you know, are really bordering on date rape that uh, would not be acceptable in the Me Too generation. So our apologies to people with any sense of decency today <laughs> for, uh, for recommending this movie. But the reason we pick this movie is because we think this captures the transmitting instinctual bias better than just about anything else we've ever seen. Okay. So uh, in order to to capture what's happening in this domain this really is the perfect music from start to end i mean from opening credits to the end of this movie it is all about transmitting yeah i was thinking that i just don't believe that it can get any more transmitting than it is yeah even the poster i mean before you go to the movie if you look at the poster with the way the fonts used for the name of the movie it's so transmitting <laughs> yes yes and so I, I think this is a good point where we can talk about what we mean by transmitting, right? Because people who are yeah. familiar with the Enneagram may not be familiar with that term. Typically, when people talk about the three subtypes of the Enneagram personality model, they're familiar with the term self-preservation, social, and either sexual or one-to-one. -one. And awareness to action, we use uh, different language for a variety of reasons. Number one is because we tend to work in organizations, so that's part of it. But a bigger reason is we just don't think that the traditional terminology really captures what's happening in this domain. And the transmitting domain is a perfect example of that. When we watch this movie, we realize that it's really not about sex, and it's really not about one-to-one -one relationships. It certainly is about transmitting, though, for sure. And, and the basic concept we have for transmitting, that it's attracting and bonding. This is all about attraction. It's like how people are doing things that draw attention all the time. Yeah, I mean, the broadcasting and the narrow casting dimension of the transmission, where you send a message to, uh, to all, and then he was interested and get to one-on-one, -on -one brought uh, narrow casting and then come back again with sending a signal to the wall and so on. It's even represented in the opening scene of the movie. Yes. You can see that and we will get to, to these details when we get to the movie. So when we talk about transmitting, very often the image that we use is the image of a peacock because we're trying to demonstrate how the transmitting domain is about behaving in ways that will get people to notice Right, to draw attention so that we can pass on something to that other person, whether it be our genes or whether it be our ideas or whether it be things that we create or even products that we might be selling to our business. The transmitting domain is not just about this deep one-to-one -one connection. The one-to-one -one connection is piece of it. Uh, sex is piece of it, but it's a much broader domain. And I think that if you were to take this movie and take out all the humans and make it a Pixar movie starring peacocks, you wouldn't notice the difference, right? I mean, it would really just be telling the same story. Yeah, and one of the main categories or things that we look, that we see in transmitters, it's the asserting, how they are, they assert themselves and they have ambition that you will see in this movie, but also low inhibition. And I couldn't see the slightest inhibition in this movie. So it's really well represented. It, it didn't seem like there was anybody who <laughs> thought about saying or doing something before they did it. Yeah, and actually I see in, the, in this movie, even the songs and the lyrics of the songs are so transmitted. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really about transmitting all the time, different dimensions of the Even when, when they say, how deep is your love? It's, it's talking yes. about intense relationship. So. <laughs> yes. Burn, baby, burn, right? Disco yeah. Inferno. Uh, and I, I was reading the lyrics from the movie Staying Alive that opens the movie, and there was something about feel the city breaking and everybody shaking, right? Which, again, yeah. is just this yeah. exuberance and transmitting. Yeah, and, and transmitting is also about impressing. And here it's all about impressing in the way they dress, in the way they dance, in the way they 
do everything. They look at each other. And uh, it's about charm. And yes. you can see that in most of the characters that are charming in their own way. There's also kind of a sweetness to the characters. Uh, all of them, I, I felt, uh, or pretty much all of them. I can't really think of anybody who didn't have some sort of redeeming tenderness underneath, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, this is something we want to be really conscious of because watching this movie on one level, you may not have a really good impression of transmitting because there is a lot of self-centeredness. There's a whole lot of self-referencing. There's a whole lot of what can seem like narcissism. But I think the movie did do a nice job of capturing that sweetness and tenderness that we tend to see in most transmitters. Yeah, I think that's what saves the movie. And I have to say that our reaction to the movie would probably depend on our own instinctual bias. So some people might not see what we're seeing, you and I, Mario, like, right. and that self-centeredness that might put us off. Other people might just enjoy it. Right. So it's not good or bad in itself, but we react to it depending on our own instinctual bias. Right. So let's, let's talk about the movie. So the movie Staying Alive, there's an interesting backstory to it. It was, it was based on a magazine article that ended up being a fraud. Okay, so the uh, person who wrote the article said it was a true story when, in fact, he just made it up. The title of the article was called Tribal Rights of the New Saturday Night. Right. So, you know, and that really captures what's happening here. As we look throughout this movie, we do see these sort of tribal rights going on. And I think that's, that's really good for the way that we approach looking at not just the Enneagram types, but the instinctual biases. We look at them almost from an anthropological perspective. Okay? We're not focused on how people experience it from the inside at first. We focus on what it looks like from the outside and what purpose it serves or what ultimate goal it, uh, it serves in our uh, evolutionary heritage. Okay? So with the transmitting domain, it's all about what are the behaviors that increase the chances that you will notice me so I can pass something along to you. So when we're talking about these domains, we're talking about things that we see. We're talking about patterns of behavior before we start trying to understand what they reflect from an internal perspective of the individual. So let's get back to describing uh, the, the movie, right? So the, uh, as, as we said, Saturday Night Fever was released in 1977. I was in junior high at the time, and I still remember when the movie came out. I was too young. My parents would not let me go see R-rated movies at the time, so I didn't get to see it in a the theater. But this movie permeated the U.S. culture like very few things ever have. This is pre-internet days. This is back when there were only, where I grew up, seven television channels, right? So a cultural event like this had a much bigger impact than cultural events do now. And at that time, everybody knew about this movie. Everybody was talking about it. In fact, when I was in junior high at one point, they decided that they would have us try to do disco dancing in gym class which was, I'll tell you, an abject failure for uh, most of the people. They, 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 they let go of that very quickly. But everybody was trying to imitate Tony Manero, uh, the character played by John Travolta. Also, John Travolta was a huge star already. He was only 23 years old, but he was in a television show that was very popular called Welcome Back, Cotter. Uh, where the uh, most famous tagline was an insult where they would tell, say to somebody, up your nose with a rubber hose, which is a bizarre thing to say, but it also permeated the culture. So when Travolta was making this movie, uh, fans were flocking everywhere to watch the filming. And so they had to actually start filming scenes in the middle of the night to escape from all the shrieking fans who were there to see Travolta. So Travolta plays a 19-year-old Bay Ridge, Brooklyn native named Tony Monero, who lives for Saturday nights uh, at the local disco. I don't know if you guys noticed it, but on the signs of the disco, the name of it, 2001 Odyssey, was spelled differently on the top as it was from the side. So, you know, mm -hmm. and apparently it was a real place. So not for a lot, a lot of care and attention to the spelling of the name. 
thanks to his stylish moves on the dance floor is you know he's he's the king of the club right when tony walks in everybody stops they have a reserved table at the club and all of that but outside the club life's not so good he has kind of a dead-end job working at a a paint store or a hardware store he's always fighting with his parents uh, particularly with his father who have a uh, his family has a starry-eyed view of father frank jr who is the uh, Tony's older brother, who is a priest and the pride and joy of the family. Things start to change for Tony when he spots another dancer named Stephanie Mangano uh, dancing at the club and kind of is smitten with her. And it's really kind of hard to tell whether he falls in love with her at that point or is just smitten by her dance moves. And it seems to me that throughout this movie, for Tony, it's not about love. It's about who's the best prop for him to dance with, right? Um, and mm-hmm. that's that's a theme we see throughout throughout the movie. Whenever he's dancing with a woman, they really just are props. They're not. He's not engaged with them in any real way uh, most of the time. So uh, um, yeah, I mean, actually, I think this is uh, how it started with Stephanie, but it developed into. Uh, different stages, different dimensions throughout the movie. I mean, it's going one dimension and then the other and so on. Yes. So uh, you, you can see it too, when he when he uh, saw her the first time dancing. So she, he's looking at the dancer. And then when he had the conversation at the studio where they are getting trained and then the coffee shop. So different dimensions are evolving throughout the relationship, yes. dynamics of the relationship between them. Yeah, I think for him, the world opens up when he meets her yes. and uh, yeah. it's a different he, he sees new things and she represents that yes absolutely you see a change in tony when he yeah. meets her and starts to interact with her and even though she's pretty limited herself in her experience of the world uh, she still has experienced much more than he has. And what we start to understand about Tony is that even though his world is a very small place, he likes to spend his time looking up at the Verrazano Narrows Bridge and daydreaming. And even though his daydreams are not really defined, he's not aspiring to anything particular, he knows, this part of him knows that there's something bigger out there, something more exciting, and he just needs to find it and figure out what it is. Awareness to Action offers a unique approach to applying the Enneagram professionally with leaders and organizations, as well as for personal development. What makes us stand apart is our Enneagram expertise and focus on understanding human nature. We know people because we see people. And this is a skill set that can be taught and learned. Human nature is complex and simple at the same time. Our mission is to help people see clearly and act accordingly. Why? Because the ability to see ourselves and others clearly and honestly is essential. It enables us to act in more adaptive and useful ways. The Multicultural Team and Awareness to Action will help you learn tools and practices to become more aware and also to understand and engage people more effectively. Learn more at awarenesstoaction.com Join us at 2021 for exciting learning opportunities. Just wanted to share something. It's although this movie um, didn't have quite an impact at that time for me, it did have an impact here in Chile as well, not just in the States. I think it was in 2008 or 9, a movie was filmed about Tony Manero and a Chilean guy who used to dance like Tony Manero and went to competitions of people who looked like Tony Manero. And his whole life revolved around dressing like him and dancing like him. It is a quite dark movie, actually, but it shows how it had an impact, not just in the States, but in many other countries. So the movie was made for $3 million, which was a pretty low budget, even for 1977, and made back more than that in its opening weekend, almost $4 million, went on to gross in the U.S. $95 million, uh, which was a lot of money back then. And a cumulative world gross was $237 million. So it was a big, big hit, right? If you figure that uh, it returned uh, almost 75 times its investment, that's pretty good. Mm. And the sound... And, and, you can, and you can tell that 
that, that it was a low budget. I, I saw like in different Saturdays, there was the same couple dancing with the same clothes. <laughs> I don't know if that's just because they shot it once or right. because they just used to wear the same clothes every Saturday. But yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think that was a cost cutting measure of um, filming multiple scenes at the same time. I noticed that as well. So the the soundtrack to the movie was huge as well. So the soundtrack sold 40 million copies, and it was the best ever selling movie soundtrack up until The Bodyguard with Whitney Houston. And again, uh, the Bee Gees were everywhere at this time. This made the Bee Gees really, really huge. And you could not go anywhere or turn on the radio without hearing a Bee Gees song for a good period there. So the uh, director was John Badham. Uh, again, John Travolta was the star. There were other, a number of other people in it, but nobody really had the breakout career, certainly, that Travolta did or you know, really stuck around. Uh, I know that the woman who played Annette uh, went on and had a TV series afterwards. I don't know whatever happened of the woman who played Stephanie. I don't think she ever really appeared in anything else after that. The reviews, not particularly kind. Uh, at the time. Siskel and Ebert from the Chicago Tribune and Chicago Sun-Times both said nice things about it. They were very prominent critics at the time. I, I, I laughed when I read the Variety review that said, the clumsy story lurches forward through predictable travail and treacle separated by phonographic records or vice versa. Not very positive. Look, this is no Citizen Kane. Okay, the movie, but but I I enjoyed watching it when I watched it again. I, I thought it was good, and I, I watched it twice for this podcast. And I have to say that I actually liked it even more the second time I rewatched it. It grew on me a bit uh, because I started to notice again some of the subtleties and nuances. How, how did you guys feel about the movie? Same thing. I watched it first for the first time in my life a few days ago, and uh, didn't particularly enjoy it. But when I started seeing the humanity of the characters and I, I, I started enjoying it a lot more. For me, actually, uh, it was really one of the important movies that I watched in my life. I think it shaped part of my youth uh, during the high school. At, I mean, I'm, I'm a transmitter. And at that time, standing out was something that uh, is important without thinking about it. And dancing was part of my way of standing out so actually going to parties and dancing with girls and so on and this movie it was like inspirational when it comes to the steps the moves and and even the the way i mean the moves are very transmitting not just <laughs> on the art it's like just transmitting all the time with this hands and the <laughs> sticking in the, in the air and so on so so for me it was it, even the way uh, travolta was uh, was wearing uh, you know, with the, uh, bringing the uh, the shirt color up, it's like right. I mean, all my shirts at that time were going up <laughs> the same way like Travolta. So for me, it's it's very close to my heart. Mm -hmm. And when I watched it again lately, it uh, actually I started to notice details that I was noticing before, due to the fact that I was like having an interview. Uh, I mean, I was like attracted to the uh, to the uh, transmitting part of the movie. It's like. Uh, trying to copy things and so on. Now I'm getting, as Maria Jose uh, said, uh, getting into the humanity of the characters more. I think this is a testament to John Travolta and his skill as an actor. Uh, Travolta has been a huge, huge movie star. Uh, he's made some really bad movies, but he's also had some iconic role. There was certainly Grease um, right after Saturday Night Fever. He made some great movies, uh, then kind of disappeared for a while then came back with pulp fiction where again even in pulp fiction his character is just compelling right i mean when travolta is on the screen you can't help but watch and i certainly felt that way watching saturday night fever and this is what happens with transmitters there's something about transmitters that when you're around them your eye just goes to them for some reason now we have to say that when we talk about transmitters we're talking about one third of the human population. So there's going to be a wide range and particularly related to their Enneagram type. So we didn't really settle on what Enneagram type we thought Travolta was or that Tony Manero was here. I do think in real life, Travolta is a transmitting two. The, the, the movie could go either way, I think, on what his Enneagram type is. But certainly 
a transmitting three or a transmitting two or a transmitting seven is going to be more uh, expressive in their transmitting than, um, say, a transmitting nine will be a little bit more restrained. A transmitting five might be a little bit more restrained. But all transmitters are going to have this ability to sort of stand out and get noticed in a group. And yeah. again, with Tra with Travolta, I, I just couldn't take my eyes off of him. Well, in fact, there's a scene where uh, Frankie, his brother, goes to the disco with him. And after watching him dance, he says, they can't keep their eyes off you. It's just, that's what happens. Yes, yes. Yeah, if, if you want to talk about scenes, I mean, <laughs> since the opening, it's like you cannot take uh, your eyes off of him. I mean, why? Yeah. The way he's walking, the way he's looking at people, the way, the way that he uh, interacts with women in the street, it's like he's creating this attraction in every move that he's doing. So, I mean, and, and you take all scenes the same way. Right. Of course, today we would call that opening scene sexual harassment, and uh, you, you know, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. but um, but but absolutely right. And so, what, how we're going to do this podcast is we're going to take three key scenes from each movie and talk about them and talk about how they uh, how they display or how they demonstrate the instinctual bias or the type. And so the first scene we are going to talk about and mention is, as Tamara just did, is the opening scene, the, the very beginning of the movie. It starts off with this shot of Manhattan and then does this nice zoom out and wraps around to Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, which is one of the boroughs and this very small sort of enclave. It, on the one hand, it's very close to Manhattan. On the other hand, it's a world away. Right. And it starts off with a shot of the Brooklyn Bridge and then goes to a shot of the Verrazano Narrow, Narrows Bridge. And again, bridges are going to be something that are a big theme in this movie because they represent aspiration, which is very much part of the transmitting domain. What am I aspiring to? What could I be? How could I grow and express myself? Yeah. And Mario, even, even the music of the opening scene, you cannot but notice it. I mean, if you're, if you are just passing by this music, it, it wouldn't like fade that way. I mean, it, it, you have to notice the music. Yes. So, so the, the, the creation of the whole scene was created to be transmitting. Yes. Yes. So in the opening scene, go ahead, Maria. Sorry. It draws you in. It's like yeah. you're part of it in some way. And, and somehow, somehow this is a transmitting behavior. I mean, if, if I, I don't know if the director is a transmitter or not, but uh, it's like, uh, capturing you from the first minute. Now I have created this very important, uh, very uh, intense bond that you're going to watch the whole movie. Yes. It starts off with the, um, after the bridges and it lands in Bay, Bay Ridge, it starts showing Tony walking down the street, but it focuses on his feet first. Right? So it's just this strut. And, and you can tell, even though it's just showing his feet, you want to know whose feet these are. Right. You, you want to know who this guy is. You want to know about him. And then when it zooms in, you see this very handsome man wearing the, the tight clothes and, you know, the hair combed perfectly, strutting down the street as if he owns the world. And Tony does own the world, right? At least he's a little slice of it. He's the king. And you see this as he's walking for sure. Yeah, and he's sending, as, as Tamara was saying earlier, he's doing these broadcasting. He's sending signals everywhere. Yes. And at times, somebody would make eye contact with him, and then that would be the narrow casting, and he would try to connect with that person unsuccessfully. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> but uh, it's all about broadcasting, sending signals by the way he moves, walk, walks, dresses, everything. Yeah, and, and this is the important part, uh, Mario, is that uh, it, I mean, the signaling can be with anything. I mean, the way you're dressing, the way you're moving, you, your look, your tone, the, what you're saying, it can be anything. Even his shoes, I mean, sh very well uh, selected shoes to transmit. I mean, you cannot but noticing the shoes. Yes. The funny thing is that he was holding paint, and yeah. that's not very attractive in itself, but you don't notice it because he's just so attractive in any, every other way. Yes. Yes. So he was holding the paint because he worked in a paint store or a hardware shop and they had run out of a particular color. So the, the boss sent him to get another one. And this is gold. 
gold, of course. <laughs> yes, <it's> yeah, <laughs> of course. Yeah, it's not. It's not going to be gray or you know, or off white or you know, yeah. pearl or something. No, it's gold. <laughs> and when he gets back to the store, you see the charming quality of Tony. And again, it's something else we tend to see in transmitters, the way this woman has been waiting for this paint for, you know, we, we don't half know an how hour. long, half an hour, half right? An hour. Okay, it was half an hour. And um, so, but he charms her into feeling good about buying the paint, which he overpriced, by the way, and was telling her that he was giving her a dollar off, even though he still overcharged her. And so it kind of shows this salesman quality that we often see in exactly. transmitters as well, right? This ability to kind of to kind of work an angle and make a deal in a, a really good way. I can see my son, who's a transmitter, doing something very similar to that, right? To to add a few bucks to his pocket, but still make the person love him for doing it. I can see Tomer doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen Tamar do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this is very important to understand the, the salesman quality of the transmitters, that the mix between the charm and the creating the experience, where it really attracted the other part and making them wanting to live such an experience, whether this experience is a product you're selling or an idea you're uh, promoting or whatever. So this salesmanship comes into multiple dimensions that you find yourself immediately. I'm hooked. I'm, I'm with you. I would like to live this. So the, it moves from the paint shop to the home. So Tony goes home, probably lives in, he lives in a little row house in Bay Ridge and uh, with a very tight and uh, volatile family, I would say. And he goes up to his room and he starts getting ready to go out on the Friday night. And the scene where he is getting dressed in front of the mirror I mean, oh my goodness, right? <laughs> I had to close my eyes. No, I didn't. <laughs> yeah. Are you interested in learning more about our approach to the Enneagram? Go to awarenesstoaction.com and check out our certification program. We offer a clear, concise, business-friendly, and science-minded approach while maintaining the depth of traditional approaches to the system. At Awareness to Action International, we're the leading innovators in the theory and pragmatic applications of this system to all aspects of the work environment, including leadership and personal development, team building, diversity and culture, and managing change. However, this approach is not just for the business world. A lot of people who attend our trainings do so for their own self-development or spiritual growth. Our certification program is one of only a handful of curricula accredited as a school by the International Enneagram Association. It is currently being conducted virtually and combines live sessions with asynchronous learning. Again, find out more at awarenesstoaction.com. So yeah, so Tony is getting ready to go out in front of the mirror and he's blow drying his hair and then combing his hair and he's standing there in his little black Speedo underwear. Uh, he's putting dancing. on dancing as he's, as he's getting ready. He's surrounded by posters in his room and yeah. each poster is very, very descriptive of the character. So first of all, there's the Bruce Lee poster. Again, Bruce Lee was huge at the time. Bruce Lee, another transmitter for sure. And uh, Al Pacino, Al Pacino, right? Uh, which uh, who who makes a recurring appearance through the movie in in, in various ways, right? Um, there's also the poster of Farrah Fawcett, uh, who I think at the time was Farrah Fawcett Majors. She was still married to Lee Majors, who played the Six Million Dollar Man. But yeah. I don't know if the two of you are aware of that, but that poster was so huge at that time. I mean, yeah. it was posters were very big in the 70s and it sold so many copies. It was everywhere. So it's not a surprise to see it. Um, there was also a poster of Rocky on the mm -hmm. uh, on the door. And apparently the director of Rocky was supposed to be the director of this movie but left due to creative differences, but they put the, uh, the poster for Rocky in there. So the posters all say something. The jewelry that he's putting on, again, very transmitting, we see in transmitters. They tend to sparkle, right? Uh, so they tend to, whenever I see a man wearing more than a watch and a wedding ring, I start to think transmitter, right? Because it's just, yeah. they just like bling. And uh, Yeah, the, the posters for me is like... Uh different facets of the legacy that 
he would love to create. Somehow it's like helping him to to shape this legacy, to give it a color, give it uh, some characteristics. So each one of these posters is part of that. The jewelry, it's like sending signals as well. So I'm I'm going out to the disco and I have to be ready with my signaling tools, my broadcast tools, and this is part of it. And the mirror is where I really perfect <laughs> all of these elements. <laughs> So it, it, it's an, it's really although it's it's like almost a silent scene, but I feel that it's full of colors and sounds and messages and, and very intense scene. Although it's a silent one. Yes, yes. I think Tony is very at home in front of a mirror for sure. So that's the oh uh, one thing I wanted to comment on, Tamara. You mentioned the term signaling, and I don't know that we've talked about that yet. But signaling is what an animal does to send messages to the other animals that hey, you should pay attention to me. Right? I am I am healthy. I am robust. I will make a good mate. And this movie is filled with signaling gestures. Right? We particularly see this with Tony and his friends when they go out, when they go to the bridge and they're jumping around, we can see this signaling behavior. And also when they go to the White Castle and start making a ruckus and uh, carrying on and everybody's kind of staring at them, but they're they're sending these signals of their vibrancy and robustness. I keep thinking about the mirror scene and how he feels so at home. And I was thinking about the difference with preservers and also with navigators. And for a navigator, it's these conflict about wanting to do a part of a, of that but thinking that it might be too much and for him as a transmitter it was never too much yes yeah, so it's quite different right so so that's a good point to bring in uh, what we see as the expression of these instinctual domains in people because i think that's a good that's a good point to be made so our view is our experience of people is that there's a very specific pattern by which the by which all of us express the three instinctual domains there's one that we call the zone of enthusiasm that we spend most of our time and energy on there's another one that we call the zone of inner conflict where we are drawn to it, but we're conflicted about it, right? It, 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 we do it more than we realize, but also we feel uncomfortable and never fully satisfied in that area. And the third is what we call a zone of indifference. And the way it typically works for transmitters is that the transmitting is the zone of enthusiasm. It's what they get, it's where they feel comfortable. It's what they get excited about. It's where they feel natural. And certainly, as Maria Jose said, Tony feels completely comfortable in transmitting, right? There is no, no inhibition in him whatsoever. With transmitters, we find that the preserving domain is this zone of inner conflict, that they're drawn to it. They, they think, you know, I really should do these things, but they never feel quite comfortable. And we see that with Tony throughout the movie, right? There's always this kind of insecurity around finances and money and, you know, other things related to the preserving domain, conflict around the, inner, around the home and uh, wanting to be part of the nuclear family, but also wanting to rebel against it. Uh, is a theme that comes up. And the area that transmitters tend to overlook is the navigating domain, which is all about understanding other people and group dynamics. And I really think that is on display here in this movie. There is not a single point where anybody asks anybody else a question about themselves, right? Yeah, well, there is one. Uh, yes, go ahead, share when that. He, when Tony asks Stephanie, if he's interesting or not, yes. or intelligent. So it's not Tony trying to find out about Stephanie. It's Tony trying to find out about what Stephanie thinks of him. Yeah. And, uh, and again, we want to be careful here. We, we don't want to imply that all transmitters are completely self-absorbed and that they only think about themselves. Again, when we pick these movies, we have to pick an extreme example of it because um, otherwise you can't see it, right? What good is it to watch a movie where you're looking at a healthy person who's not overdoing the domain in some way? Uh, we just wouldn't be able to see it. So uh, certainly there are a lot of transmitters who are interested in other people at least for a short while. Yeah. Maybe maybe uh, there are no scenes where uh, they ask about uh, the others, but you can see some gestures, like um, in the uh, scene of the, uh, of the, I think, the dinner, where uh, after shouting, he went to his mother and she said I, something like, I don't want you uh, to feel sad or so on. It's like, like caring for her. 
I mean, right. the, his, his, his discussion with his brother uh, felt intimate somehow. I mean, felt like caring for each other somehow. But yeah. I, 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 I have to admit, yes, that was <laughs> little uh, scenes and it was like subtle justice. Somehow. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and again, I think there's a difference between caring about someone and generally looking out for their well-being and sharing an interest in their thoughts or their experiences and that sort of thing, right? Yeah. So even in those scenes, there is this tenderness, but there's not really an attempt to get inside of the other person necessarily. There's also the interesting scene where the father is asking, he's telling the father about the raise, and the father says, ah, you should have told us this during dinner. We could have used the conversation. But it would never occur to the father to say, hey, Tony, tell us about your day or something like that. Right. So and and this is what happens with transmitters is that very often it's almost that you have to inject yourself if you want to be heard. The transmitter is not going to wait and draw things out of you. You have to put it out there just like they do. So when you're dealing with transmitters, you need to remember this. Right. You can get lost sort of uh, uh, pushed out of the conversation if you don't push yourself into it. Yeah, but, but I, I, I just want to make a point there that I think that that's what they naturally do, but it's not because they're not interested. Yes. It's because it's they're used to doing that. Yes. But they might care. I mean, they care about the other person. They just don't yes. ask probably more, I mean, as much as you could expect. And, and, and they do expect you to put your point out there, right? And so if you sit there quietly and politely waiting to be asked about yourself, they're going to think, oh, this person's really boring, right? I, I don't know anything about them because they're not telling me anything about themselves. So the second scene uh, that we wanted to talk about is the first scene where Tony goes to the disco. Now, again, you can pick any of the three or four disco scenes as great examples of transmitting in different ways, but there are some really nice touches in the first one. Uh, uh, first of all, the feeling that I got as they're walking into the club is that these are lions on the hunt for prey. Okay? Uh, this is, you know, uh, yes, we're going to, we're going to be seen, but we're we're on the lookout too because you remember what they were talking about as they're walking into the club, right? Um, the timing for the car, how they're going yeah. to use the car, <laughs> yes. not longer than ten minutes yes. each. Yes, <laughs> yes, they're exactly right, and they're using the car as basically a cheap motel room uh, is 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 the plan. Mm -hmm. right? Before they walk in, Tony says to them, you know, okay, guys, get your act together. We are the faces, right? They refer, they refer to themselves as the faces. And when they enter the room, uh, there's the disco version of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony playing to announce their arrival. And again, as you walk in, everybody's looking at them. Everybody's looking at Tony. It's like the wave, you know, the waters are parting as Tony walks through yeah. the room. Yeah, and, and actually they move around. They, I mean, they signal, they, I mean, they look at people, people look at them, uh, like uh, admiring them until, uh, I guess, until they reach their uh, their special table. or The reserve table, table, yes. They do yeah. have a reserve and, table. And even that, they have a special table in, the, in a very a special location and reserved for them. So, so the whole thing is really it's like uh, highlighting, like uh, underscoring these group of people. Yeah. And, uh, and even Tony's seat at the table is right by the railing, right by the dance floor where everybody can see him and he can see everything that's going on. So let, let's talk about when Tony gets on the dance floor. Yeah, so, so they're different times but to me what comes to mind is when uh he's dancing with this doreen i think it's her name the, the one who wiped the sweat off his brow yes <laughs> and and or or and then there's these uh, and then was he stops dancing because he didn't like the music yes yeah but then when he's dancing i don't know remember with who and this song starts playing and he just needs to do his show and it was just so transmitting. So, so this is my time. I mean, for, for me, it's like, I mean, it starts with really uh, charming the other, uh, his partner in the dance and dancing with her for a very, very uh, short time. And then taking the center of the stage and becoming the stars and the dance becomes around them. Even, even in the scene of the dance where all of them dance the same moves together, the same steps together. Yeah, the it's like he, start, 
yeah, he's starting it. And it starts uh, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And he's still the center. He's like, yes. he's the pace setter of the dance. I mean, everyone is looking at him and taking the step with him and so on. So yeah. it's, it's all about his being the center of the dance, whether he's dancing with another person or dancing on his own or dancing even in a bigger group. He's always the, the center of the dance. And so the, it's almost as if the people he's dancing with are nothing more than props for him. Necessary evils to create the opportunity for him to get up and be on display, right? So it's Doreen, the, the young woman who wipes the sweat off him, and then uh, Annette, the one who uh, wants to be his partner, wants to sleep with him. And even with Stephanie, although, again, he certainly falls for Stephanie a bit more than the others, but... It's, it's it's she's there to reflect his glory in some way okay. uh, my re, my reaction to it it's funny I, I i again it had been years since i'd seen the movie and i just felt this kind of giddiness right this sort of joy watching him dance and even though it's corny and uh, i was never a big disco person it just i just couldn't help but feel really good and at the same time, feeling like I was watching something that I shouldn't have been watching, right? Uh, it almost felt like I had walked into a room where people were having sex that I shouldn't be watching. It, it, it was very conflicted for me, but uh, certainly a fun thing to watch. Yeah, and 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 especially for uh, Stephanie, I felt somehow, I mean, or maybe this is uh, my reflection, I felt somehow like he was looking at her that this is the right level that, that I, sh- I, I should be at. Yeah. In terms of uh, you know intellect, in terms of uh, dancing, uh, uh, dancing well and so on, it's like she's she's the right fit to my uh, my great dancing, to my great personality, to my you know uh, spark and everything. So it's like no one else can be with me on the stage except someone who deserves. It. Right. So uh, th- this is a good point to move us on to the next scene, which is. Um, the scene where Stephanie and Tony go for coffee. And we should probably take a break, but I'm going to make uh, just a couple of quick more points before we move on there. Number one is the Al Pacino references. We saw, we talked about the poster, and there are a couple of women who think that he is Al Pacino on the dance floor. And one of them says, kiss me. And when he does, she just said, oh, I just kissed Al Pacino. And you could see him kind of glowing about being mistaken for Al Pacino. And the next morning when he wakes up, he's parading in his underwear, chanting Al Pacino and, uh, and Attica uh, in front of his elderly grandmother, who is quite embarrassed by this behavior. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the, the line Attica comes from the movie Dog Day Afternoon, which was very popular uh, during that time. The other thing I couldn't help but notice when Tony wakes up in the morning, the positioning of the hair dryer uh, above his bed uh, in the angle uh, or on the on the corner of the uh, dresser, it was just a really phallic image. I mean, <laughs> right? I mean, it could all, all I could see is a big penis there. So, uh, which again gets to the, uh, the, the 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 theme of this movie. So, uh, on that note, let's take another quick break here, and then we'll move on to the third scene. Are you interested in learning more about our approach to the Enneagram? Go to awarenesstoaction.com and check out our certification program. We offer a clear, concise, business-friendly, and science-minded approach while maintaining the depth of traditional approaches to the system. At Awareness to Action International, we're the leading innovators in the theory and pragmatic applications of this system to all aspects of the work environment, including leadership and personal development, team building, diversity and culture, and managing change. However, this approach is not just for the business world. A lot of people who attend our trainings do so for their own self-development or spiritual growth. Our certification program is one of only a handful of curricula accredited as a school by the International Enneagram Association. It is currently being conducted virtually and combines live sessions with asynchronous learning. Again, find out more at awarenesstoaction.com. Okay, so the third scene, the key scene is when Stephanie and Tony go for coffee. He convinces her to spend a little bit more time with her so they get to know each other. And uh, Maria Jose, tell me about your reaction to this scene. She changed. She was all quiet, reserved, not wanting to connect. But then all of a sudden she starts talking. 
and talking, talking and bragging about all the people that she's supposed to be working with. He doesn't know anyone that she mentioned and she makes him feel really bad about it. But it's just a bit fake yeah. from her side. It's like she's pretending and she's showing off, but not really. It's, it's like almost sad that she's trying to show all of that uh, to impress him. But it's, she's kind of impressing herself. It's, it's, she's trying to convince herself that she's really great, that she's moving on. It might not even matter if Tony was on the other side of the table. She was kind of just talking about it. He was an audience. Yeah, she was not connecting with him. She was just talking to herself. And for for me, actually, it was uh, a very interesting scene where he, I mean, I agree with you, Mariozia, that he felt bad about himself. But at the same time, he felt like challenged. This is where I want to be uh, somehow. So maybe maybe I need to work on my whatever. I mean, my life to be at that level. This is where I deserve to be someone like this. I need to match and so on. So somehow he felt bad, and that, but at the same time ch- challenged to, to really achieve something, achieve at least a relationship, deserving to achieve a relationship with, uh, with such a person. And she looked completely like not interested in, uh, in an intimate relationship rather than an audience, as you said, uh, Mario. Somehow, I think she represented at this moment the other side of the bridge for him. Somehow, this is where I want to be. I'm not there yet, but I need to cross the bridge. So this is what I want to work on. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that going back to what transmitting is about, and part of it is legacy, and although he's not clear about what he wants to do next, He's thinking about it. So he knows that dancing is short-lived, that he will not be able to do that forever. So what am I going to do? And she shows him a bigger world, and and that's what he's drawn drawn into. There's a couple interesting points to uh, regarding the nature of transmitters because we don't want to give the impression that transmitters are always talking all the time. And Stephanie is a good example of that. She hardly says anything for the first 40 minutes of the movie or so. Uh, but once she does start talking, it's it's a monologue, right? It's a, you know, She might as well be performing for Tony. Again, she's someone who doesn't, for me, wasn't particularly likable up until much later in the movie where you start to see this vulnerability in her and this tenderness towards the end of the movie, particularly the vulnerability. And again, uh, we start to see that uh, people are more complicated than we tend to think they are and uh, have to look past the uh, initial behaviors. Uh, a couple of things in there, uh, she was name dropping like crazy, right? She talked about Cat Stevens and David yeah. Bowie and uh, Eric Clapton and Laurence Olivier. Again, names from certainly from. <laughs> and the funny, it was funny when she mentioned Romeo and Juliet. And, <laughs> and Tony said, yeah, from Shakespeare. No, 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 no. It's another director. Steffarelli, right? right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so certainly my, my sons would refer to her as a try hard, uh, which is, you know, somebody who is trying hard to, to put on an image that's a little bit beyond where they really are. Yeah, the, the, the part of talking a lot or being the center of attention uh, somehow I felt, I mean, uh, I like your comments, uh, Maria, about the first 40 minutes that she, she's not talking a lot or really. And, and I felt that because Tony was, it, it was the stage of Tony. I mean, the first 40 minutes, it was all the lights are uh, focusing on Tony. And when they went to the coffee shop, now they are in, on equal foot. Now she can draw the attention. Now she can take the spotlight. Only then she started to transmit. Yes. Yes. My, uh, my favorite line uh, from the coffee shop is when she says to him, you know, I'm, I'm not going to have, you know, I'm not going to make it with you. And he says, well, why not? And as he's saying, why not? He's got a mouthful of cheeseburger and food on his chin and all of these things. He's just so oblivious to how he's coming across to someone at that time. This is, is an entertaining scene. There, there was a lot of kind of corniness uh, that you see in Tony, right? When, for example, when she says, oh, nobody knows how much I've grown. And he says, oh, well, maybe you should go on a diet. So he's, again, yeah. not, not a particularly sophisticated guy. 
And another uh, interesting scene, uh, uh, the scene with, uh, with the Latino, uh, the competition and the Latino couple, that, that was very interesting that you would expect him to feel happy that he won the, uh, the award. But on the contrary, he was really upset and frustrated that there is someone who deserves it and they are just giving him an award that he does not deserve. So that, right. that was an interesting thing. What, what does this say, Mario, about them, I think, uh, if if it say something well it, it, so it, it certainly does so uh, the whole movie is building up to this to this contest okay? and tony wins it every year and you you start to understand that it's really kind of a rigged contest because clearly this puerto rican couple i keep referring to them as you know the puerto rican couple uh, are such better dancers than tony and stephanie are and yet they're given the second place award and Again, this is where you start to see the behind the mask of the transmitter, right? They're they're actually more self-aware than we might think because they do concern themselves with how other people think, just like all of us do. But there is this you know, layer of self-awareness that sometimes takes us by surprise. And we start to see this. I, I think we're seeing this shift in Tony throughout the movie where he goes from being the one who's talking all the time at first to being one who's more self-reflective and trying to understand himself. And so certainly it shows that humanity inside of Tony that takes a while for us to see sometimes. And this can be our experience, particularly if you're not a transmitter. It can be your experience of transmitters, of uh, realizing that they're not self-centered, but they they do have these deeper layers to them. I, I also think that there's a theme through the movie, throughout the movie, about competition. And yes. it's competition of tribes, competition of dancing and being better than yep. the other. And at some point, it's like Tony sees that his playing field where he's competing is just too small and he wants a bigger playing field so that he can compete with the people that he deserves or that at another level and that's work that's where he wants to live that's where he wants to dance or the friends that he wants to have but it has to do with having a worth while competitor somebody at a higher level yeah absolutely absolutely so we've talked about three scenes i wanted to make an honorable mention particular call out to bridges in general and particularly the verrazano narrows bridge and um, uh, we talked about how the movie starts off with scenes of bridges and then there's also that scene where the tender moment between stephanie and tony where he's trying to console her because she's starting to see that her life is kind of a mess and so they sit at the bridge and he starts telling her all the things that he knows about the bridge and again the bridge as well as her represent a life beyond what i've experienced that there's something more out there there are other scenes that involve the bridge, right? Uh, a couple of really important scenes. Uh, the first one is where they play the joke on a net. They're jumping around on the edge of the bridge, pretend to fall off, and the net freaks out, and you know they're just playing a joke on her. But then also there's the other scene on the bridge where, what is the character's name? I think Bobby C., uh, who Bobby, I guess. Yeah, yeah, Bobby, who falls off the bridge and dies, and uh, mm -hmm. he's struggling because his girlfriend is pregnant. He doesn't know what to do, and it's almost a suicide, really. So there's a lot of kind of signaling that happens on that bridge when they're climbing up the the wires and showing off, uh, but also certainly some tragedy associated with that bridge. And I think they, you know, not to read too much philosophically into the movie. The bridge represents the the span of life and the the scope of life. Right there's uh, there's fun, there's freedom, but there's also tragedy. Tony is telling Stephanie about somebody falling into the cement and dying and being buried mm -hmm. in the bridge. Right, so uh, mm -hmm. bridges have a a lot of meaning throughout the movie. Okay, so um, any additional thoughts or comments on the movie that we've dissected and great well i i uh, i enjoyed watching the movie i enjoyed the discussion because uh, actually both of you have brought uh, different dimensions because i watched this as, as a transmitter so <laughs> so maybe I, <laughs> I did not see lots of things that you have seen but uh, but uh, i enjoyed it very much and uh, and you know what i would like to watch the movie now once again after this discussion so to reflect uh, on 
the points that we discussed and see them once again in the movie. And I think uh, many of our uh, listeners would do that. Uh, well. it, it was interesting to me to try to not assess the characters' types, integrant types, and but but you can say you can see how it's transmitting all over but there are different ways in which that transmitting manifests and there's some four characters or two characters or and that's interesting and that also makes me want to watch it again to look into that so that's one of the challenges of finding good characters in movies uh, we often forget that a movie is a collaborative experience right there's one person who writes the script and then often other people will rewrite scenes the director has his influence over the character the actor has his or her influence over the character and so it's not that easy to find really clear and vivid enneagram types in movies which is why we're looking at the whole movie as a theme for the type rather than specific characters in this podcast series I just want to say that as a final thought, I, I, I again, I, I think the movie's worth watching, particularly if you're looking for these things, and it can be really instructive if you want to understand the transmitting domain. And again, with the understanding that it's an extreme version of the transmitting domain. And what we'll start to understand from an enneagrammatic perspective is that this domain, again, it's not just about sex, right? It's not just about one-to-one -one relationships. In fact, there's a funny line in there where somebody asks Tony if he's going to make it with Annette. And he says, now, you know, you make it with some of these chicks and they think you got to dance with them. So for him, the dancing is primary, right? It's, it's, and he doesn't want anything to get in the way of that. So it's all about the transmitting domain is all about how do we draw attention to ourselves? How do we get noticed so that we can pass something on to other people and have a deep connection with them in the meantime? Yeah. And, and that's interesting, Maya, that, uh, that actually the Enneagram, the lens of the Enneagram can, uh, we can see things through the lens of the Enneagram, not only people. Yes, definitely, we can see people who can understand them and appreciate them and, and, and build a relationship with them. But as well, we can see teams, we can see uh, uh, couples, we can see organizations uh, through the lens of the Enneagram, as much as we have seen a full movie through the lens of the Enneagram today uh, with the transmitting theme. So it, it helps a lot to, to understand things and really build relationships with them. So that's it for our podcast. Again, visit us at awarenesstoaction.com for more resources and stay tuned um, for future episodes. I think next time we're going to take on the navigating domain and talk about that. So thanks for joining us, everyone. Tamara, Maria, Jose, thanks for being here, and we'll see you next time. You've been listening to the Awareness to Action Enneagram podcast. Thanks for listening, and we hope you'll join us for the next episode. In the meantime, if you've enjoyed the podcast, we ask you to go to wherever you get your podcasts and give us a review. Visit us at awarenesstoaction.com and follow Awareness to Action on social media.